Welcome to today's episode of Demystifying Science, where we have with us today Dr. Ted Pavlik from Arizona State University, who studies complexity. And this is a topic that is particularly close to my heart, because when I was in graduate school, I was studying basically bacterial metabolism. And I became very, very disheartened by the idea that traditional approaches could actually allow us to understand much about metabolism as an entire system. Because you look at the map of what a metabolic pathway looks like inside of a bacterium, and you have thousands upon thousands of inputs and outputs and readouts, and many things are layering on top of each other to affect the same sort of readout that you'll get from whatever assay that you run. But it seems like you have developed the ability to look at very, very complex, perhaps even quasi-civilizational level systems and get something informative and valuable out of them. Yeah, well, so, uh, and I, I definitely uh, uh, appreciate that, um, you know, somehow I mean, when you look down at the complexity of these sort of systems, whether they be these uh, metabolic pathways, like, like you mentioned, or, you know, at a, at a level that is more close to sort of where I work, you know, the level of, say, ant colonies, um, then it does seem like there's a lot of things that might be important, but it's not clear that they're important. And and as you start studying them, it almost is is not satisfying because you you almost forget why you started to study that system in the first place. And so like, if I was to, to look at, uh, you know, a flock of birds, for example, I might be intrigued by the shapes that these, these giant envelopes of these birds take on. But if I really want to understand what's going on there, then, you know, I naturally want to track an individual bird and what that bird is doing. And as I start getting down into the micro grain details of it, I start kind of forgetting the forest by, by studying the tree and it's natural to kind of zap all enthusiasm out of it because it just seems like this, how am I going to get from this individual out to this, um, this level here? So we've been trying to find ways in which we can kind of think about the macro as something that is just as tangible as the micro. And so one of the things like we've been doing, for example, is, is I work with this collaborator, uh, Jürgen Liebig, who studies these beautiful Indian jumping ants. They're called Harpignathus saltator, Jordan's jumping ant. They're um, very charismatic. So they're these ants from India that are about, you know, say an inch long or so. Um, and uh, they have these giant mandibles that are sort of actually forward. Um, and they're that, that way because they can hunt for live prey. And so they jump and they can pierce this live prey and carry it into their nest. And, and there's all sorts of interesting things about their life history um, that are distinct from other ants. And one of the kind of important things about it is that uh, workers, uh, so female workers inside the ant colony, in most ants that we talk about and sort of ants 101, are going to be effectively sterile individuals, sort of an extended phenotype of the queen. They're just kind of there as sort of cells that have flaked off from the queen and are able to sort of do the queens uh, to help raise the other uh, offspring. Now, these ants have retained the ability to mate, and they can not only mate with um, in general, but they can mate with their brothers and even their sons with no inbreeding depression. And so after a colony has lost her queen, then the workers can themselves start mating and uh, or have stored up sperm from previous matings and take over. And so what's beautiful about this process is there it sets up kind of this um, example where we can watch a social transition in at a time scale that we normally can't watch it at. And so um, there's a sort of this famous experiment from Australia um, about watching the pitch drop where they take tar and they pour it into this kind of funnel and, uh, and then it starts forming a drop. And as that drop forms, it takes like 10 years to actually complete that process and, and actually pinch off and fall. And so you can record this thing in high def video and really understand the fluid dynamics of how this happens. And, and we realized this was a system where we could sort of understand at a high, you know, fine grained time scale of how social transitions happen. And so we can remove the queens from these Harpignathus or a grad student named Ben Pineson can remove the queens from these, um, start them off in this sort of disoriented state where then they go through a 21 day roughly process of electing the next committee of egg layers and they it's important to pick just a few of them because whoever gets 
transitioned into this role actually stops being able to do that hunting that I began to uh, talk about before their brains actually change their ovaries change and they just totally become a completely different animal. Um, and eventually once you get a couple of them, then the process stops and the, uh, and the, the, the colony goes on until all the reproductives are removed again. Now in the past decade of people say studying these ants or, or a little bit longer than that people have realized during that 21 day period there are certain like you say um certain metabolic pathways you could call them that that seem to be important there's for one thing you can see ants will periodically do this dueling behavior where they they, they go up nose to nose with another ant and they go back and forth and back and forth and and it, it uh, they aren't actually attacking each other it appears to be triggering internal changes that trigger this kind of physiological difference. So it's necessary, but, um, but you know, it, it's one of the things that's extremely conspicuous. But we're wondering, are there other things that could actually be going on during this period that could help give us a better idea of how you get from uh, one macro, macro scale state of sort of, you know, no hierarchy to another one of hierarchy. And so what a student of mine did is Taeyong Che, he, um, he said, well, what most people would do is track every single ant individually, like those birds, or, or tracking every single metabolic pathway. We realized that, that you know, simply putting coordinates on every ant, so you know, this ant is in this position, this ant's in this position, and the next frame, and slightly different positions, the next frame, um, that was extremely tedious to do. And then you also then lose a bunch of information because you've gone from this picture of this big, beautiful ant that has all of these different behaviors. It twists its body in different ways. It's very, it's very informative watching these individuals, turning them just into coordinates. We said that that is one way to go, but it probably, there's probably other ways we could do it. So what Taeyong figured out how he could do is, uh, is you can take these 21 days worth of video and pipe them into a deep neural network that he the specially designed so that um, it can look at the raw video data and it can be trained to say, these are um, video segments, little 30 second segments from these 21 day videos that come from particular times in the hierarchy. They're um, at day one, day 21, day 15, and so on. And what he was able to find is that without giving the neural network any information about what we know about the ants, about dueling or anything else like that, it was able to take 30 second video segments, ones that it hasn't been trained on, new ones, and predict where pretty accurately where they fall in this 21 day period. It's and, and is the idea you're looking for actual events that constitute the decision making process in this shift, this group behavior shift, you're kind of teasing out the decision making back to the end. Right, right. So, I mean, the, the problem, well, so what motivated this whole thing is that before we did this, uh, our, our, color, our, our collaborator, uh, Jürgen Liebig, would have a grad student just sit and watch video for huge amounts of time looking for interesting things that were going on, interesting from a human perspective. Um, but it's hard for, you know, you can't like watch the whole video and sort of go back and kind of take a, you know, it, it's different. It, this is not a very good human task to do to sort of screen these videos for possible behaviors. And so our first question was, could a neural network possibly be able to, given a, a small segment of video, predict where it came from? In other words, could it key in on certain things that were happening that kind of showed we were later in the hierarchy formation process or earlier? Mm. And, and, and that's the first thing he did is accrue that. Then the second thing he did was build a second network that could look inside the first network and ask it, okay, there's got all these complicated, ugly, latent variables inside the, the brain of this first neural network. And was able to say, can we look at those and say, for any given video segment, which parts of the brain of this neural network are lighting up? And can we visualize those back on the original video? So that he could then put little spotlights on areas of the video that appear to be informative in order to make the right decision. And, and that's where these novel behaviors are occurring at. These the, you're hoping to discover these decision making features. Right. That's, that's right. And so and so what what he found on the first pass here is that it discovered things like dueling. So it was able to highlight the dueling that we knew ahead of time was important, but we. We never told the neural network, so it was able to find that, that sort of thing there. And so now, what we've gone is we've got now we've gone from um, a huge amount of video data to now a bunch of these sort of slices, uh, you know, frames from these videos that the, and with highlights where the neural network has said, "Here's something that was helpful to me." 
I don't know. This might be totally by random chance, but I think you should go and investigate this. Mm. And so now, instead of having a grad student watch all 21 days of these videos, we can now have um, you know, even people who are less specialized knowledge um, look down through these and say, look at all these kind of pre-screened, you know, slight frames from these videos. Do you notice commonalities? And from there, we can form new ideas about what might be going on. But then we could go. So what are like some of the, what are some of the new ideas that have popped out? Have there been new before, behavior? Before we move on to that, I actually really want to ask about uh, the way that the neural networks are trained. So you say that you train it, but you don't give it any information about dueling or the behaviors that you know. So what does it actually entail to give a computer program a video and then consider it to be trained afterwards? Right. So so we can feed it. So this is a sort of a supervised um, uh, setup here where we can feed it examples of video segments that come early in the process and later. And we can tell it that this is a day one video. Mm. This is a day 21 video. Mm. And we can give them that from, from different um, colonies, for example. And then each video, um, there's all sorts of these like little tiny data science technical things. Like you want to make sure that it's looking at the ants and not looking at the plaster that the ants are walking on. Mm -hmm. And so we have to do certain things like, um, well, maybe we don't give them the, the, the raw video exactly. Maybe we can give them what we call it like an optical flow. So we give them actually sort of the, the, um, the rate of change from one frame to another. Or maybe we rotate the video several different times. And so it's not just trained in one orientation, it's trained in multiple orientations. There are all sorts of things we have to do. But the, the essence of it all is we can give it um, a video and you know, we tell it what day the video is from. And here's the video segment. And what day the, the other video is from. Here's the video segment. And we have a whole training set of those. And then we have a test set of video segments that we know the day, but it doesn't know the day. And then we can say, how well did you predict the day? And it turns out that it can do pretty well. And this is, you're comparing it on videos of the same, roughly the same group of ants, or you're using different group of ants. So if you train it on, so it seems to me that the way that you create these disordered conditions is you take away the hierarchy by removing the queen, then there's this dissolution into dueling and behaviors and committee making. It takes 21 days. On the other side of it, you have a queen. Do you then... After training with videos of that process, do you repeat the process with the same group of ants? Or do you have a different colony where you remove that queen and look at that? Like, how translatable is it across? Great. Yeah, well, so one of the, the great things about um, Harpignathus is, um, is we can create multiple colonies of roughly the same size, same number of brood, and so on. And so in this particular study that, that I that talked about here, which is just kind of, you just, just had published, um, is that we used um, several colonies of the same size. Now, since then, while we were going through writing that up, um, ben, the, the animal behavior student who's attached to Jurgen's lab, um, has gone through and created uh, a database of a wide range of videos from other sizes. And so we can then start to see how well do these things generalize. And we can start answering that question. So right now we know that given that we train it on roughly, say, and these are these this particular species of ants lives in relatively small colonies. And so we can train it, let's say, on about 60 ants. And the it appears to have generalizability across other colonies, which also happen to be around, say, 60 ants. So then the question is, um, does that generalizability hold for 20? Does it hold for 150? And if it doesn't, is that because there's a fundamental shift in how the societies work? Or does that just mean that it's become more cryptic because the density is increased and now the neural network doesn't know how to deal with density and we have to sort of figure out you know, that? So that's kind of the next step. And so likewise, the, the earlier question about what new things have been found, um, we are currently mining through that data now. Right now, as a proof of principle, um, we were just excited to see that dueling came out um, and other behaviors that look dueling-like. So sometimes you can have three ants kind of come together with their heads pointed towards each other. If I just showed you that, then superficially, you might say it looks like they're in a duel. But the neural network was able to actually tease out the differences between duels and things that aren't duels that we, at least as humans, would think look like duels. So then the next step is to go down through and all the other candidates that's generated and see, are there other things there? And we don't think this replaces tracking individual ants, like the kind of standard ways things we're doing. But we do think that this general idea of training 
neural networks on it really comes down to just control versus treatment. Like, um, you know, we could, you know, in, in, in principle, we could uh, have other types of conditions, things that don't change over time. But you might say, here's a bunch of ants that have been treated with a particular drug. Here's a bunch of ants that have are uh, are low in oxygen. Here's a bunch of ants that you know you could imagine a bunch of different treatments relative to some control, and not knowing exactly what possible things, what behavioral outcomes could come out of that, we could use a similar system to say um, there's a bunch of anti-like behavior that we can factor out, and we could see that actually you know and now. Norm people already do this, but they do it with very coarse grain metrics like the density increased, the average speed increased. With this, we hope to actually be able to say, look, there's actually more of this weird behavior that occurs where two ants crawl on top of each other or something like that. Um, and that only really occurs in the treatment group. And that's something that might be really easily missed by a human observer who's kind of zoomed out and just looking for like how frenetic the ants are. So Basically, you're fighting against this tendency to reduce the information to locations. Do you imagine, can I zoom out from this and kind of ask you to consider what other applications you could imagine this sort of training pattern to be efficacious in? Like, it seems to be perfect for discovering new targets for molecular disorders in the body, things like that. Is there anyone working on that, to your knowledge, or what are some of the other applications that you've? <clears throat> yeah, do you with? have an answer for metabolism? <laughs> yeah, so so that's that's a little bit out, out outside of my area. I can tell you, I did. Um, I went to um, uh, when I was in grad school. My office mate was doing computer vision work with um, with swarms of, of bees, and he was trying to figure out. Uh, which bees, so back in that time, there were two hypotheses. And so there was blobs of bees would fly from one point to another. And, um, and these, um, and only say 20 of them would actually know where they were going. So this is after they found a new nest. And so at that time, there were, there was a hypothesis that you either could have so-called gentle guides where there are these bees flying roughly at the same speed of other bees, but they were just had a little bit of a bias in themselves. And so um, because they tended to want to go in one direction and they were sort of stubborn, then the rest of the group would kind of go with them. And so people like Ian Cousin and so on who study fish, they were kind of uh, you know advocates for this gentle guide hypothesis. But um, Tom Seeley, who was uh, my colleague, my, my office mate's collaborator, who's a really big bee guy up in Cornell, he his anecdotal experience was that there were always some bees that were flying really, really fast through the swarm, much faster than the rest. And, um, and, and he, it was his thought that it's possible they could be steering, actively steering. And I, I swear I'll get back to your question in, in just a second. But, but, um, but Kevin, my office mate then, was able to generate sort of some computer vision that was able to track all of the bees from like looking upwards at them and was able to find that there was this small subgroup of bees and they did seem to be kind of steering the colony in the way that kind of you'd expect from the sort of what they call a streaker hypothesis instead of a gentle guide hypothesis. Now, Kevin was used to use the exact same stuff. They're like bee dogs, like bee sheep dogs. That's right. Yeah, they were kind of corralling or hurting the bees. Yeah, in that sort of way, right? Um, and so, but Kevin was able to, uh, on, along with that, also took data sets on these pancreatic cells that were kind of these like you know uh, these blobs that were moving around, and he would try to apply the same sort of thing to see like um, can you predict the motion of other blobs from like you know, the motion of certain, like, are there ones driving the kind of collective motion and so on? And that ended up being kind of uh, a to be determined because um, it turns out um, the bees were much, much easier to track because mm. they have so much more inertia. They, you know, they're a tiny little nut that's flying through the air that doesn't turn on a dime. And all of those things end up being like much more helpful. Um, but, uh, but still the, the insight was there. So I guess what I'm trying to say, there are people who are definitely looking at at those i have a colleague here at asu who's who's looking at the movement of cancer cells in the brain and um uh, because they have a thought that actually they're foraging for oxygen and um and so you know is the oxygen availability and you know actually cause them to sort of stick to certain vascular structures and um and sort of trying to understand like is there like a highway in the brain uh, that the cancer cells have to use so there are definitely people who are looking at these questions. I, I don't look at these questions specifically. I definitely think we, we could apply that if we had the right data set. 
the broader impacts we've kind of considered have been more at even the sort of a human social level, where once we've looked at this sort of pitch drop, we can understand these social transitions over long periods of time. If we learn kind of important generalizable cues, then we could say, well, let's look at video in a mall or something like that. And are there things, um, you know, things that, that are relatively simple, we wouldn't need to necessarily send them up to a, cr a cloud for analysis, you know, so, so for privacy preservation, that would might indicate that, you know, there's something that's off nominal about this behavior that might suggest that maybe a riot is about to break out or something along those lines. And that might um, you know, raise red flags and say like, well, maybe we need a human to to look at this. So it might sort of help reduce the cognitive load on human security guards, you know, as it, because it would help prioritize, you know, which videos to look at. And, and, and it's, uh, it's future crime detection. It's like reminds me of a Philip K. Dick book or something. Minority Report, I think, yeah. Minority Report. Right. There you go. Well, I mean, even even years ago, um, there was a, an article in control and decision or uh, IEEE mag magazine on control systems, um, a control systems magazine that, that actually was using drift diffusion models from cognitive science to characterize how good a human was at making a decision about a video in front of them. And at the point at which it seemed like the human was going to be effectively making a random choice, like you've looked so long at this video um, our models suggest any decision you make is going to be random, it would switch to a new video and say, Let, let's look at something else. And so um, so th that's kind of the things that we're sort of thinking about is that that the we're not necessarily trying to have a, you know, predict what's going to happen um, and, uh, and have the computer be the arbiter of that. But we're trying to come up with these augmented intelligence schemes that consider the dynamics of the system you're looking at and also the dynamics of the cognition inside the person so that you can make them a true team where it's really knowledge co-creation and uh, an actuation um, so that we're not asking one to do everything if that makes sense you've used the term intelligence and brain and vision in relation to computers and computer programs and these are terms that I feel get mentioned without there being a universal agreement upon what it is that they're implying. Mm -hmm. So for, right. for me, when you say that something has a brain, um, I, I immediately imagine an organism or a system that is not only capable of learning, but it's capable of innovating. It is capable of coming up with novel solutions to things but oftentimes when I talk to people who work on computer programs, it comes down to the fact that there is a training set for a specific stimulus, and then the computer can work within that stimulus, but it's never going to suddenly develop an ability to look for a new stimulus, unless you right. specifically train it to do so. Is that... It, the, the programs that you're using are when you said that they have a brain. When you say that they can see, what does that actually mean? Right, that, that's a great question, and and also you know, I, in the, the question of like what is a brain. Um, so I mean, I, I I walk in a couple of different disciplinary circles. Some with physiologists, some with behavioral ecologists, some with engineers, and depending on which um, group you're in. Um, the significance of having a brain um, varies, and so you you to some of the people that I work with, um, a brain really has to mean um, that decision making is centralized in an organism. So, when is it useful for there to be a central center of decision making? And so, um, whereas you know, there of course are theories out there about. Um, you know, animals, uh, a lot of animals have brains and plants maybe don't um, because animals have to move themselves around and plants are planted and animals are animated. And so you need a central area to coordinate the motion of all of these things. Um, and that actually, you know, fits with things like when we look at ants, um, there's a lot of ephemeral brainness in ants. And so I mentioned bees, for example, are highly related to ants. Um, that there's when they move from one nest to another, only 20 bees out of you know thousands know where the new nest is, and so um, and those 20 once they hit the new nest fold back into the rest of them and stop being the kind of you know the migration bees, you know. So it's like when temporarily when you needed to move everybody, then they there was suddenly a group that took control 
moved everybody and then disintegrated back into the background again. Um, so the brain is like the embodiment of the decision making process. I, I would say that, that yeah, what, like sometimes we say, what is a brain? And I would say a brain, it would be a um, centralized location for information processing where, where most of the important information gets to and most of the important decisions are made and then actuated from. Um, and, um, and then, you know, but then that, that, so that's the reason why I love looking at bio. So as an engineer, I love looking at biology for a, for for looking at all sorts of exceptions and diversity so you know not every not every animal even has a brain you know there are some that have nerve nets for example that are a little bit more distributed and things and and yet they still manage to do so that's you know uh, it comes back to the question of when do we need a brain and and and, and if i were to translate that engineering then i can say um when do we need um like so right now there's a lot of work in engineering and computer science on, on so-called federated learning so you know, there was a, a big push to put everything up into the cloud. So for the longest time, when I was in grad school and engineering, the people would say, how are you going to have the computational power to do that? Like somebody would present their dissertation and it would show some really interesting results on autonomous cars or whatever. And then there'd inevitably be somebody raise their hand and say, um, how long did it take you to generate that trajectory? And they'd say, oh, on my super powerful desktop machine, it took a week or something. And that was a trajectory for one drive, you know, that was supposed to happen in the morning of, you know, some car or whatever. And they'd say, well, well, how how do you expect that to scale? Like you know, and then people people would always then say, well, it's in the cloud. So eventually, you'll just be able to put it in the cloud, and it'll happen instantaneously. Sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. That's right. Exactly right. Right. Yes, yeah, so you're counting on magic. Um, and and for a long time, people that's where everything went. And then people start realizing that that um, that although we could make magic in the cloud to some extent. <laughs> Maybe we don't want to be giving the magician all of our, you know, all of our biometrics or all of our details and mm -hmm. things like that. And so now federated learning was sort of this idea that, okay, let's, um, we're going to take everything away from the king and kind of concentrate power in the states, you know, is we're going to create kind of this federated thing where out at the, on the edge is where we're going to have the computing. And, um, and so we're going to do a lot of information processing on the edge and then send anonymized things as needed back to a central area. And then get stuff, anonymized stuff back from it. And so that way we could somehow still gather information from across the globe, but uh, we would still keep most of the fine grain details localized. And so like once you get into these sorts of architectures, then it is hard to say like, well, where is the brain in that machine? The brain seems like an abstract idea that is implemented on a substrate that is spread all over the place. And so I think that paradigm is kind of shifting in biology too, though. The more that you look at, you know, especially the involvement of the gut and goes, you know, the gut feeling. And honestly, there are all sorts of immune decisions being made all throughout your body. Um, so absolutely, it's interesting how yeah. that idea of the brain is kind of dissolving, especially the more we understand the immune system and the way that it interacts with the nervous system. And Right. And I, I think that's a great point. And that's why, so for me, like I said, I travel in a bunch of circles, but I mean, the, the, the one, the one area of biology that's close to my heart is behavioral ecology. And in behavioral ecology, there is a, um, there is a fundamental distinction between mechanism and function. And, um, and on, on the side of that also between mechanism, phylogeny, phylogeny, ontogeny, development and, um, function. And, um, and so sometimes when I have to ask somebody, what do you mean by brain? Um, I have to ask them effectively, are you referring to brain as function or brain as mechanism? So there's that wet hunk of matter that's underneath my skull and you can ask questions about it, but those are mechanistic questions. Mm. Or like you just said, um, effectively you can ask functional questions about information processing and we can refer to that as being a brain colloquially, but Really, we're talking about something function. I know in, in mm -hmm. neuroscience, there are people that are now debating this, like for a long time. So cognitive sciences have sort of asserted that there are modules in the brain that do not necessarily relate to true, you know, uh, to, to, to true structures that actually exist in it. Like this is an attentional area. There must be a module for emotion, these sorts of things. And we just sort of take them for granted that these things actually exist. And I think to a behavioral ecologist, they would say, well, you, like, it seems like you're mixing function and mechanism. Mm. And I'm now starting to see conversations in neuroscience where they're actually calling for people to 
to be more formal about these things and say, don't refer to an attention center of the brain, refer to attention as a function, and then tell me about how different mechanisms in, uh, in the brain contribute to that function. But we can study those as separate uh, entities. And so I guess I, I would apologize for using the word brain earlier. I guess it was just convenient. But I think it's a very deep uh, rabbit hole to really say, when we talk about the brain in conversation, what are we really getting at? And, and that comes back to my last point there. Is it, are we getting at a function or are we getting at a mechanism? And once we're clear about that, then maybe we can have more intelligent conversations. Intelligent conversations. I love that. Yeah, it's a, it's a huge problem too. I think at the cutting edge of physics, confusing material with effects, you know, especially things that we understand and harness so well in engineering because oftentimes the functional description, the quantitative relationships are sufficient to be able to develop pretty powerful tech without actually concerning yourself with the material actors involved. And so it's it's cool to hear it laid out that way. Uh, although, you know, it's interesting it, it, you bring up engineering. I mean, so I, I teach a lot of, of engineers about how to create intelligent things and all that, and how to com compare to biology. And it's interesting to me that the conflation of function and mechanism, I feel like is still very strong in engineering, even though engineers have to build things because they will assume that the things they built to do the thing they're going to do always do that thing. So you, you assume like uh, you could say, well, how do I, how do I make this robot um, find a light source? And I'd say, well, follow a photo gradient or whatever. And so, you know, and, and so they build some mechanism that causes the robot hopefully to move toward a light source. And they will just assume that, that like they might even implement some form of gradient calculator inside the, the um, inside the brain, the inside the, the central processing of the robot. And just because it's calculating a gradient doesn't mean that that gradient is actually the physical gradient, you know, it's just the output from whatever your photo res resistors are telling you or whatever. Right. Right. Or even if they've got some like, you know, sophisticated mathematical model that they're that filtering the photo re the resistors through like the little CDS cells go into a model, which estimates the actual gradient. And then they get a numerical value of the gradient and they try to climb that gradient. And they'll tell me, no, oh, it's climbing a gradient. I programmed it to climb a gradient because it estimates a gradient and climbs that thing. And say, well, well, most of the time you'll be in an environment where the gradient inside the head of that robot will be the gradient in the physical space, but that need not be the case. Mm -hmm. Like you just happen to build a mechanism that's pretty darn good at its function, but I bet I could put it into an environment where we would get really confused. And so we have to be clear that just because you wrote gradient climbing into your code doesn't mean it's actually going to climb a gradient. Mm. And what are the conditions under which you would take a robot that has been programmed to climb a gradient and confuse it sufficiently for it to not do that? I mean, um, so you could maybe in a mirrored area or something mm. like that. Uh, I've got colleagues who, um, I've got a colleague who um, is doing, he does a lot of work with computer vision in autonomy, specifically um, big monolithic robots and, and cars. And, um, and he really believes that it's important for, you, you can't just train a neural network to do computer vision, that you really need a knowledge backend as well. And those two things can kind of work together. And, and that's in order to make sense of weird things in the world. And he brings up these points to like, if you took most autonomous vehicles, you know, that are, are driving, you know, uh, in test, like, uh, I, I mean, I live near Tempe, Arizona, and, you know, and Google drives a lot of its own cars around, or Alphabet, uh, Waymo drives a lot of its cars around. And, and you see these cars driving around working fine. Imagine if they pulled up behind a car that, and this is an example I borrowed from him, that just had a giant mirror on the back of that car. You know, I would, that would be weird to me if I pulled up to it, but I would suddenly realize that I was looking at me and it was looking at a mirror and I could, I could deal with that. The autonomous vehicle now, granted it has more than just vision sensors, but if you just focus on the vision, that's going to totally upset the vision system. So that's kind of an example where, um, where you, you, you really like the, the mechanisms that work under a non mirrored world, are going to be totally broken under a mirrored world. And yet mechanisms in my brain seem totally fine with that. And you can imagine all sorts of interference uh, messing with the initial input receptors and in your robots or whatever else too, that would just could look like it was being overloaded with voltage when it wasn't. Or ultimately, ultimately it's only capable of reporting if it's, if it's function, what its function is, is 
what's what's functioning what's functionally happening right. what's happening well and, and on the flip side of this um and this is something else that we study and that we're really excited about is that um a lot of times at the micro scale, when we see little errors in sensing and sensory motor actuation and all that sort of stuff, um, we initially, you know, it, it's tempting to call those errors. And if we were engineering the systems and we saw um, these things, we would say, well, we need to get rid of that. We need to, we need to shield this cable or, you know, we need to put in these filters or something like that. But, um, but in the biological systems, um, those errors are often sort of embedded as, as important parts of the system. So, um, so as an example, there's, um, if you look across, a lot of people know about ants and, uh, and trail laying. And so not every ant lays trails. So that's something not, a, not everybody knows, but ants 101, you hear about ants and trail laying. Now, certain ants like Laceus niger, which is uh, a, the, the garden ant that you see in Europe a lot. Um, that ant, um, when you watch it lay trails, it follows those trails like perfectly. And um, so ants just kind of walk down those trails. It's a very good trail layer. And you can put out feeders um, for these ants. And, um, and they'll, uh, if there's like a good feeder, like it's got a lot of food in it, a bad feeder doesn't have that much food in it, then it'll go to, the, it'll, it'll, they'll, they'll scrutinize the two feeders and eventually collapse to one uh, a line going to the good feeder. Now, what they realized back in studies in the 80s, early 90s, is if you take these feeders and you swap them, um, so that now the bad feeders and the good feeder place, um, the ants will, will swap so that they'll now find the good feeder again. But then if you swap them, um, back, um, sometimes they're not very good at sort of tracking the other way. So, or in other words, if, if you remove a feeder, they're good at resetting, but if you swap, you know, two feeders for each other, they're just not very good at tracking the, 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 these things back and forth. And mathematical models, simplistic mathematical models of trail laying kind of suggest that I actually behave the same way. And so we just sort of assumed that these ants were, you know, they, they were using a simple rule and it worked most of the time, and, and, uh, but it would easily be tripped up. Now, cut to maybe 10 years later, um, and, and people start thinking that maybe noise and mistakes could be useful, and maybe ants could be smarter than Nace Lacius Niger. So, um, so other, some other people, some people I know down in Australia who did this um, initially, um, there's other ants that are pretty good trail layers, but they're just noisier about their trail laying. And so um, they speculated that maybe you'd get a different result with these ants. And so they gave the ants a lot of these same, these, these other ants, these Fidoli dentata, for example. So there are these other types of ants that happen to lay trails. And, but um, when they lay a trail, an ant will come up to the trail and she might not always follow a trail. Maybe 20% of the time, she'll come up to an area that definitely has chemical on it and just go another way. And, what was cool about these ants is when you put them in the same sort of um, assays, they have no trouble tracking the good food as you switch it back and forth. And when you look at what's going on, it actually looks like the ants that are making mistakes are constantly putting a population of ants out in areas that might somehow, sometime uh, be a better feeder. And so the mistakes are really sort of um, a, a bet hedging strategy in order to, to deal with the fact that sometimes in, they live in an ephemeral environments where sometimes you have to change things up. These are the artists. So, These are the uh, artist ants. They're out there on the edge exploring uh, you know, right. nine, out of ten ter- nine out of 10 are terrible ideas, but every once in a while, you know. That's right. That's exactly. And, and so, and that's one way to interpret it is, you know, it's like, you know, most of the time they're wasting all this effort. But in reality, because fitness is assessed at the level of the colony, Really, um, we don't we don't want to give a score to an ant. We want to give a good score to the colony. That's where function lives at the colony. Function doesn't live in the ant. We don't want to call an error an ant. The error is the laciest colony that can't track. You know, so I don't care how how well an individual ant follows a chemical trail if it means their colony starves. So um, so, but there are downsides to um, to putting you know twenty percent of your foraging force out exploring where usually there's no food. And so, um, so not surprisingly, Laceus happened to evolve in an area where things were more steady and Fidoli happened to evolve in, in areas where things are more ephemeral. And so um, there's, so some people have called this kind of a stochastic resonance in ants where there's an optimal noise value that every ant has to, um, has to make use of in order to properly sort of shape its recruitment patterns. And so, I don't know, the whole reason I'm bringing this up is like, 
we have to sort of ask where are we assessing function? And when we start assessing function where it actually kind of rears its head, you know, like at the colony level, things that we would have called ugly noise or mistakes or sensory limitations or whatever might themselves actually be a mechanism that really contributes to function. And this is the same as the junk DNA in the 90s, where there was a gradual push towards realizing that, well, it might not be reasonable to think that 97% of what is contained within the genetic material isn't actually a useful aspect. Right, right. That's a great point. And, and it's funny, and then now that, um, so there's this area of, um, in, of evolutionary computing called genetic programming. Hmm. And, um, and in genetic programming, you basically, there's a bunch of cool things you can do with it. Um, you can, um, you basically can have a computer write code for you. Hmm. So you can say the code has to do these 10 things, these unit tests or whatever. Like maybe it always has to um, count the number of letters in a string or whatever, but then you can also put pressures on it. Like, and I want you to do it using as little energy as possible and so on and so forth. And so you can, uh, or um, using as little code as possible or, or as little memory as possible. And, and you might not know how to, to come up with a novel algorithm for this particular thing, but you just let the computer evolve. So it creates populations of programs that compete against each other. And then it promotes those that do well and uh, demotes the ones that, that don't. And then at the end, you get a, a terminal population of programs that may have done something that is novel. And so one interesting thing that happens in these genetic programs is you get an accumulation of junk code. So, um, so like for anybody who's done kind of programming out there, you can imagine like if I had a loop that had said like while false and then anything inside that loop would have like a bunch of code in there and then end while, that loop would never be executed. So it would be like an intron in, in DNA, you know? So, but with one little change, like if that while false gets mutated into a while true or while some condition, suddenly that code gets turned on. And what they find is that if you prune away this stuff um, in the process because it's not operational, you tend to find that your programs don't evolve quite as quickly. So there's these little like miniature experiments going mm. on in the junk that are kind of like, you know, they're, they're sort of walled off. They can't do any harm while they're behind that wild false. And they can be, and, and they can then take evolutionary leaps forward in function. Whereas if you didn't have that, you would have to every single minuscule change. You'd actually have to, have to build it from scratch. Well, yeah, and, and, and every minor change would have to keep from breaking the function of the existing code. Because nothing could step up, sort of. It's like shark teeth. You lose one and you have rows of three that can come forward. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. And so you kind of need a, a, a sandbox on which you can play with things and then periodically um, you know, unleash whatever you developed in the sandbox. And maybe that'll be terrible. But that, that makes a really interesting argument for like a free and open not only society, but business plans for the way that you actually invest in your innovation as a civilization, because it seems like you need this baseline level of wealth. You need this reservoir in order to pay for folks to sit around and make mistakes sometimes. I don't know if you've right. thought about how this applies to like civilization level structures, but it seems... In a more utopian way, because I, I keep thinking about the sort of dystopian version of security guards and malls watching programs, directing things, but this idea of using the same principles to build positive outcomes for development? Is that kind of where you're going? It just seems like an art. Like there's, there's definitely a pressure in civilization for people to get on, you know, a tried and true track with their lives. You know, uh, it's been really interesting just from a personal standpoint, being an artist and being a creator, but also having gone through the academy and worked in science and worked in these huge institutional machines there's always this tug of war between spending time on creative processes. You know, you see this divide between labs, the way that PIs handle their labs. I had an amazing advisor uh, in graduate school who, when I showed up, essentially, you know, I did a rotate, I did some rotations and I chose this lab and he said, all right, go ahead and play for the next year. Like just gets, you know, we knew what system we were going to work on. And he was just like, just look around, just see what you can find that's interesting here. You know, and that's an insane thing that almost no other PI that I knew of did at the time. And I think it was really amazing because you know, we did discover something really cool eventually. Um, and it took it took a while. It took a lot of tinkering and building new detectors and 
trial and error and not really coming up with anything to say, you know, not having anything to write a grant about. It's a risky decision to do that. And so I think what what you're seeing this pattern play out evolutionarily in nature is something that could really be taken home to the business level, to the institutional level, in terms of just reinforcing the value on cre- like dedicated, wasteful, you know, creative time. Like it's not necessarily wasteful in the end, obviously. It's just not directly productive, right? I think that we do have a society, as a society, we have kind of decided that the things that we will value are is the labor that will be immediately productive. Mm-hmm. And yeah, it does really seem to suggest that biological systems function best when there's a whole bunch of labor that might be walled off that's not particularly productive, that at a moment's notice can be sort of pulled up to to take the place of something that is crashed and burned. I think about right. this all the time in terms of retracted research, right? You have these huge laboratories that are publishing in big papers and big journals and everything's very fancy and they're doing great. And then all of a sudden there's somebody who's working in the background who's like, I don't think that's how that works. And then the person at the top falls and then the other person is able to step up and be like, look, this is the direction that we should go. But if you haven't published for a long time, if you if you haven't if it's been years between successes, it can be very hard to maintain the funding from university or government levels to actually right. pursue that. Right. And that's a great point. I, and what, and so I, I do want to say, so as a caveat, the, the little like genetic programming example, um, that is sort of suggesting that uh, in biology, that these introns are junk until they're turned on, which of course now we're finding out that, you know, they, they might actually be being used even if they're not. So th- there's probably a lot more interesting stuff going on in biology than the kind of the dumb programming example. But <laughs> but but I take all those points. And I think you, your point uh, there about um, sort of what we choose to, I mean, you could argue that in the private sector, things like venture capital um, really are expecting a very low rate on return. And they're constantly spinning up companies that go down. It's sort of unfortunate from the research side of things that we aren't learning that much about it. And and I don't I'm not going to try not to go up on the soapbox too much here, but but you know like you know it's state institutions, um, you know major you know major universities. Once upon a time, or at least I know a lot of my colleagues got into the faculty route because they pictured a place of intellectual freedom. Pipes, allowed- elbow patches. That's right. P- velvet paneled libraries. <laughs> right, right. Where you go in and you come up with crazy ideas in the morning and you play with them all week and sometimes they don't work out and it's all fine. Um, and um, Instead you find yourself screaming at grad students at three in the morning after their experiments aren't working and things. Well, well yeah. And you, you ask, well, what are the pressures there that, that have caused that? And, and you could, <laughs> you could look at it. There's now a much, once upon a time, there was much more investment and in the public um, in the public university. And so we once viewed the public university as a public good. It was an institution that we pay for that produces ideas, it produces talent, um, it is where people go to mature intellectually, and so on and so forth. Um, but gradually, that became less palatable for people to want to fund. And um, and so I, I teach a lot of courses on sustainability. We talk about, you know, what's the difference between like you know, public goods and private goods and so on and so forth. And really effectively what we've done is even though we call public universities public goods, because they still are governed by state charters, they still get money from the states. And and you know, but if you look at the if you look at their budgets, a huge amount of the support for public universities comes from tuition. And and you might say, well, that's fine because those individuals are going to get an education that's going to be valuable to them. They should pay for that education. And sure, but that changes the nature of the university to being a private good that somebody has to pay for to get get out of it. And it also means that instead of the universities trying to generate public goods like ideas, the universities try to generate things that attract tuition dollars. And so, um, so there is going to be a pressure on a faculty member to become very prestigious because if they become very prestigious, then that means a faculty member at another university is going to recognize them when U.S. News and World Report sends them a survey. And that's going to then move that original university up in the rankings to get more students and parents who look at those rankings to enroll in that and so on and so forth. And so the chase of tuition dollars largely changes the character of institutions where it becomes much harder 
to be, I mean, and if you think about it too, like you know, there's other sort of trickle down effects like that, like TA availability, you know, in courses. And so a lot of people, a lot of their students don't think about, they don't know what their TAs are, you know, and they don't realize their TAs are grad students <laughs> who are being paid to um, help participate in the teaching process and so on. But the grad students also have their own dissertations to write. And, and so we're subsidizing the generation of really cool ideas by giving people TAs. And as TA availability gets less and less and less, what we're basically saying is that grad students have to be funded either by fellowship on their own or by RAs alone, which is on targeted research projects. And it's going to be a lot harder for them to go off and investigate these other things. So again, I don't want to get up on a sort of a soapbox here, but I do think that it's interesting that the venture capitalists are still willing to take more risks than I think the public is when they invest in public universities. Mm -hmm. I mean, to tie that back to the, the machine learning and analysis of how systems work or don't work, is this, is this sort of, is this loop something that you could study and parameterize well enough to then be able to say an intervention at this point and this point would be the most effective at creating the desired outcome. Because it often seems like you talk to university professors, you talk to students, you talk to... It seems every single stakeholder in this situation looks around and agrees that it's not in a very good state. So it seems like it would be relatively... Or at least an antiquated state. Or at least, right, it's not modern or updated. And so what, is it possible to create programs that analyze real human systems like this to be able to say that these are the pivot points? And if we do these three interventions that everyone can agree on, we'll get to where we want to go? Well, I think so in principle. Now, now I do a lot more kind of armchair, um, you know, fundamental research where like I'm studying ant colonies, right? So it's hard for me to extrapolate with a straight face to <laughs> a lot of human systems. But... Um, but there is some, some work that I did with, uh, an old colleague, uh, um, Takao Sasaki and, um, and a woman who, um, works in, um, homing pigeons, Dora Biro, really well known for homing pigeon research. And, and so we used, um, with the lead author in this work was a postdoc from my lab, Gabriele Valentini, and he used these frameworks called transfer entropy that sort of are able to, if you give them large spatiotemporal data sets where you can imagine each trace is a different individual's actions. And so I have your actions through time, my actions through time, someone else's actions through time, and so on. And I don't know who is interacting with who, but I can look at these things and I can say, um, do I notice that every single time person A does certain behaviors, person B does certain behaviors a little bit later? And, um, and if I start seeing these sorts of things, then I can start forming these type of, um, I don't want to say causal links, but they're, they're meant to kind of be um, an indication of possible causality. So they're still correlated, but, um, but, but still that you, you can kind of get an idea of who's doing what. And so um, these sorts of things revealed, at least with the, so with these homing pigeons, um, Taka and, uh, and Dora came up with this really cool, I don't know if you've heard of the spaghetti tower experiment. Um, but it's uh, sometimes you do it in like team building exercises and you, you give, um, you give a bunch of people just a box of spaghetti and then, and I, I forget what you put, like you give them maybe some bubble gum or something like that to like fasten the spaghetti together. And you'd have them to try to build the tallest tower. And, um, and then, so in the spaghetti tower, there's this like cumulative cultural evolution experiment where they you, like two people at a time keep building the tower. And so you have like two people work on it for a half hour and then you swap one of them out and bring a new person in and swap one out and bring a new person in. Or you just have um, two people work for the entire, whatever, four hours on the spaghetti tower. And it turns out that by swapping the new ones in, you actually get much taller towers. So, um, so it's kind of an interesting thing. What, what Taka and Dora figured out is, is you can, um, you could do the same thing with homing pigeons where you displace them, you know, miles away and, and then you release, um, two and you watch how they fly back to their home and then you displace them again. And then you re um, release another two where one came from the original group and then another one was a naive bird. And you can do that over and over again. And if you find, if you, if you do the same two over and over and over again, you can see how well does the route improve over time. But it turns out the route improves much better over time if you keep swapping in a new bird. Um, and so, um, so what 
Gabrielle, what Gabri did is he looked at traces from these and analyzed them with transfer entropy and noticed that there would be bouts of kind of, you can call them exploration and exploitation. So exploitation, kind of what they previously did and exploration, they're kind of going in areas that they hadn't seen before. And you could, you could actually tell which bird triggered the bout of exploration through this process. And, um, and we kind of would expect it always would be the naive bird, like the naive birds kind of tugging the one with it. That's kind of like the narrative we would tell. But the weird thing about it is a lot of the bouts of exploration were triggered by the experienced bird only in the presence of the naive bird. So there was like a, a team dynamic that was emerged from just having a new individual with the old bird that allowed the old bird to do something that had, hadn't done before. I think that's um, the scientific manifestation of the feeling where if you listen to a song or you watch a video or you do something by yourself. Something you're working on. Or something that you're working on. Sorry, even, we right? work on songs and videos. So. <laughs> well, I, I mean, yeah, something creative and then you bring someone into the room to, to experience it with you. You see all these new things jump out. And it's literally depending on who it is and how you know them and your relationship to them, the things that you will see are completely different. Mm -hmm. Right, right, right. And yeah, and great, and that's that that very well could be a great analogy for that. Thank really you for, for for that. But but the, the, the reason I brought it up is that like in theory, if you had a giant data set of people's actions over huge amounts of time, we might be able to start understanding the weird like like you might always expect everything's provost driven at a university. Like the provost makes a decision and that changes everything. But you don't realize as you bring new faculty in, they maybe have a plastic deformation on the provost herself. Um, you know, or something like that. And in theory, maybe in the future, we could start to be, start to analyzing these things in this particular way and forming kind of new models of it. Um, and the last kind of a, a quick example of that from the animal systems that I really like about this, and this isn't from my lab, but sort of this famous work in social foraging theory that, um, by, among other people, the kind of big research associated with this guy named Luca Lane Giraldo, and um, where you would take birds these little i think they were spice finches and uh and you put them on the ground and with little pods that maybe had seeds in them or maybe not and so the birds would go around and you could watch their heads and they would either be looking up or they'd be looking straight, straight down very clear and the ones who were looking up whenever another bird found seeds it would run over and they would uh steal the seeds they would exploit you know that way and so we called them scroungers and the ones looking down they wouldn't ever run this get the others while they're looking down, but they would find seeds and exploit the seeds they found to call them producers. Now you put 10 birds together and consistently you'll always get certain birds being producers, certain birds being scroungers. And you put them away in cages, away from each other forever. You bring them back eight months later, put them in the same thing, same four birds, producers, same whatever, six birds, scroungers. Now you'd swap one bird out. Doesn't matter if producer or scrounger, one bird with a novel bird, the mix totally changes. And, um, and, you know, and that sounds pretty cool. But what was really cool about it is, is after Geraldo did that, then he took models from older social forage, from older optimal foraging theories, this thing called the marginal value theorem, and said, if we run this little marginal value theorem program on modeled birds, we get the exact same pattern out. And so we even though it had this really beautiful macroscopic pattern, um, it ends up being explainable by really totally simple kind of low-level rules. And so, and what is the mar um, what is the marginal value theorem? What does it say? The marginal value theorem basically says you continue to do a strategy until the instantaneous return from that strategy falls below the long-term return from the environment. So, um, so it's it's easiest to explain in terms of how long I stay in an area. So if I go to a bush looking for berries, um, if there are a bunch of bushes around so that it's really easy to find other bushes with other berries, I probably don't stay in that bush very long because the rate of return from the environment is really high. So my instantaneous return in that bush is going to quickly plummet below the long-term return. But if you start spreading those bushes apart, then I'm probably going to stay in each bush for longer because the rate of return from the environment is so low that I want to exploit one bush for longer. And you can generalize this idea to discrete strategies like producers and scroungers. And you can then predict if one bird is slightly better at something and another bird is slightly better at something else, then you can get them tending to be kind of 
producers for longer than other birds. And so, so you get this kind of diversity there. And when you put all the same birds together, you lock into the same pattern, but just a change of one bird, it's like a domino that changes all the rest of these. And so I bring this up because it shows that, you know, getting going full circle to your original question about metabolism, um, there are simple rules of interaction that if we know the right rules, we maybe can find those interventions. We can find that one faculty member that kick out of the university and put the new one back in and may change the entire system. But it's going to be subtle and it's going to take a lot of thinking. And I think it's going to take not only mathematical models and computational models, but I think it's going to us to sort of accept that the world around us, there's organismal models of all sorts of beautiful social behaviors that we can borrow from when thinking about how we restructure our own human societies. So even though spice finches and ants and whatever else don't look like humans, they all represent to me different contexts that are thought provoking. Hmm. And that's why I think we should be stressing uh, sort of, you know, a, a, an emphasis on natural history and diversity, because I really think that um, diverse perspectives from nature help us enhance our diverse perspectives about our own systems. That's beautiful. I love it. Yeah. That seems like a good place to wrap for today. Yeah. I, I don't know if we, uh, yeah. I don't know if we can go up from there. That was very well said. Where can, well, thank you so much. Go ahead. Oh yeah. Where, where can folks find out more about what you're doing? Do you, uh, do you have a lab website coming up or what's, uh, uh well, you do social so media? I, yeah, well, it's probably social media and my Google Scholar page. So the academics go to my Google Scholar um, for pretty much anybody else. Um, just uh, find me at Twitter. I'm at Ted Pavlik, T-E-D-P-A-V-L-I-C. And uh, feel free to reach out. I'm always happy to talk about this stuff. Excellent. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Pavlik. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. And don't forget to support us on Patreon, folks. We'll see you next week. Bye. Bye, guys.